practicing mindfulness means keeping something in mind. Practicing right mindfulness means keeping two activities in mind that we're going to be doing here as we meditate. One is being with the breath. The Buddha calls this keeping track of the body in and of itself. In other words, you don't think about your body, how it looks to other people, how it looks to you, whether it's strong enough to do the work you want, how much longer it's going to last. Just be with it right now, your sensation of the body right here. That's something you know you've got right here. That's as John Fuang said, if you can doubt the fact that you're breathing, then you doubt everything. There's nothing certain in the world at all. So focus on something that's sure. You've got the body here. You've got the breath coming in, the breath going out. That's one of the activities, just staying with the sensation of the breathing. The other activity, the Buddha calls, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. All your thoughts about what you want out of the world here, things that you've been disappointed with in the world. Put those aside. The problem is we're very quick at picking them up. Even though a lot of those issues are not right here, right now, we create them and then go into them. They become little worlds. We're so good at that creating worlds for our thoughts, worlds for our emotions, and then entering into them, losing our bearings here with the breath. So one of the things you have to take apart is not only your greed and distress with reference to the world, but just any reference to the world at all. The Taijans talk about this a lot. They use a word, it's a Pali term. Samadhi in Thai, it's pronounced samud. It can be translated as convention or supposition. One of the examples they like to give is uh, paper money. It's just paper, but we give it a value. We agree that it has a certain value in the fact that the agreement goes on. And enough people agree with it that we can actually get some value out of the paper. And these suppositions have their purposes, they serve their functions. But you don't want to carry them in to areas where they're not appropriate. And right now, any supposition that has anything to do with the world at all is not appropriate. People complain about how hard it is to practice nowadays. And part of it is because we're invaded by the suppositions of the world all the time. We carry little screens around with us. We're constantly in contact with other people who have those suppositions. So we, in order to be in conversation with them, we have to pick up their suppositions. But when you're coming here to be alone with your breath, you want to divest yourself of those ideas. For the time being, think of the world outside simply as an idea. And that's what it is in your mind right now. It's just an idea. You have no other direct experience with it. Memories of the past. Yeah, those are things you've churned up inside. Plans for the future you've churned up inside. You can even take your sense of how you're sitting, where's east, where's west, where's north, south. And try to erase those. Think about the fact that your mind is here. And we think that the mind is facing forward because the eyes are in the front of the body. And the information from the eyes takes up so much of our awareness. But now that our eyes are closed, we don't need to think about which direction is forward, which direction is back, up or down. As the Buddha said, you want to make forward and back, up and down all equal. So it's just awareness. That's just one of the conventions of the world that we've brought in. The more of these conventions you can put aside, the more of these suppositions you can put aside and see them as suppositions, things you have supposed into being.
and then watch for the mind that wants to go out and get involved in those worlds again. And ask it, where are you going? Why are you going? And the more thoroughly you can put away these ideas, the easier it will be to, to stay with the breath in and of itself. And develop your sensitivity for what's actually going on right here. Instead of knowing so much about out there, ask yourself something simple. The Buddha starts out with something very, very simple. He says, you discern long breathing, you discern short breathing. It's interesting that in his instructions for breath meditation, the only place where he uses the word, or in this case the verb, to discern is in the very first step, discerning long breathing, discerning short breathing. How are you going to know if a breath is long or short? Well, you have to be mindful. And then on top of that, you have to make comparisons. Is this breath longer than the last one, or is it shorter? That requires that you remember the last breath, and you can compare it. It's not like you can put two breaths side by side next to each other. The last breath is gone while you're with this breath, and yet you're able to compare it. What are the functions of the mind that allow you to do that? It's mindfulness and discernment. You're passing judgment. You want to get anchored in something that's right here, something you don't have to suppose into being. But you do have to exercise some mental functions, and you want to get good at that. You want to get good at keeping something in mind that's relevant to what you want to do, and have that ability to make comparisons. You read so much about the, what's wrong with the judging mind or the comparing mind. But the only place I ever saw the Buddha counsel against the judging mind is when he says, don't try to judge other people's attainments. You can never really know for sure what someone else's attainment is. But you do want to pass judgment on which people are good to hang around with, which people are not, and which mental states are good to hang around with and which ones are not. And you want to go get to know so you can judge these things for yourself. That requires your powers of observation, learning how to ask the right questions. Because that's a lot of what discernment is. When the Buddha talks about the factors for awakening, there are two processes or, or two exercises that he says are really helpful. One is developing appropriate attention, the ability to ask the right questions, and the other is to practice breath meditation. It's not as if they were two things that you do separately. You do them together. You focus on the breath and you bring the right questions for the breath and for your mind's relationship to the breath. We're here looking at three things, basically, the breath, the feelings that come up from the breath, and then the mind state that watches and that is soothed by the breath. The mind is both on the receiving end and on the proactive end. On the proactive end, it tries to figure out which kind of breathing is more comfortable, long or short. Because that's what appropriate attention is. It asks you which kind of things are having a good effect and which kind of things are having a bad effect. Then they extend that to when the breath feels comfortable and give rise to a sense of well-being, even a sense of rapture. What do you do with it? Well, you spread it around. You expand your awareness. And try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out. And then you ask yourself, what kind of impact is the breath having on the body? What kind of impact is the breath having on the mind? If the mind needs to be gladdened, okay, you're happy to breathe in a way that gives energy. If the mind needs to be steadied, you breathe in a way that's more calming. And you get more and more sensitive to the fact that you are doing things here in the present moment to create this experience. 
and the desire to do it well, and the questions you ask as a result of desiring it to do it well. That's what takes us simply beyond being with the breath, and it turns into right, right view, appropriate attention. And once the mind feels soothed by the breath, it'll settle down. The breath itself, then, as the mind settles down and gets more steady, the breath will get more and more calm. It can even get to the point where it stops, because your brain isn't using so little oxygen and the breath energies in the body are so well connected that you don't need to breathe. Now you're not stopping the breath because you're forcing it to stop, it's just you feel no need for it. The mind is that calm. Then the next question is, what do you do with that calm? What do you do with the equanimity and stillness? The Buddha talks about developing the factors of awakening even further. He says you take seclusion, by which he means the mind and concentration, and try to develop this passion. You do that by looking at how inconstant are the things that you tend to latch on to. They come, they go. And so much of our interest in them is very, very constructed. In other words, a little something happens out in the world and we have to embroider it to make it satisfying enough, interesting enough. But when you see the extent to which you have to put so much effort into getting satisfaction out of things that are just going to keep leaving you, you begin to wonder, well, why do I go for that? What's the allure? And when you can start taking apart some of the suppositions or conventions that you use to create interest in the world or to function in the world, you can get down to where the real allure for these things is, what gratification you're getting out of them. And when you begin to see that the allure is not worth it when it's compared with the drawbacks. That's when you develop this passion. And your interest in all these things that you fabricate begins to cease. The fabrications themselves begin to cease. And it's there as you keep analyzing what's going on. But it's a very subtle kind of analysis on top of what you've done here. And the mind finally lets go, and it let go, lets go of everything. Even those most basic conventions and suppositions at that point, even the conventions of the path itself. This is something that can be done. It's not just a story that comes from ancient India. You read the stories about people gaining awakening, listening to the Buddha, and you wonder, why is it so easy for them and so hard for us? That's hard to say. We'd have to go back and interview them. But we do have the teachings of the Forest of Johns, people who practice with them. You say that it still can be done. It may be harder now. It may require more work because there are more suppositions to undo. It's really hard to say. But a lot of it has to do with our willingness to put our suppositions aside. Step back from even the most basic things we assume about ourselves and we assume about the world. Say, what would the mind be like if we could just drop those assumptions for the time being? We're not denying that they are valid, that they have their place. But when you bring them into the mind, you create a lot of trouble for yourself. And when you bring them in areas where they're not relevant. So right now the issues of the world are not relevant. See how much you can put them aside, let them go. And focus on what needs to be done to get the mind to settle down, to develop these qualities of basically concentration and discernment in dialogue with each other.
because that's what it comes down to. When you look at the factors for awakening, you've got discernment first, and it leads to concentration. When you look at the five faculties, the concentration leads to discernment. They're in dialogue. And the dialogue is about appropriate attention. Where is the suffering right now? What am I doing to cause it? What qualities of mind can I develop to help abandon the cause? So I can realize what the noble people of the past, past have realized. That the news of awakening doesn't have to be just their news. It can be our news, too. But you have to remember that putting aside of suppositions is not just something that happens at the end of the path. When you're asking appropriate attention, you're just looking at everything in terms of cause and effect, action and result. And a lot of the constructs of the world that we build around our actions and our identities and our thoughts about the world get in the way of seeing the actions and the results. So get your discernment in dialogue with your concentration to strip these things away. And you find that instead of becoming poor, you're actually richer as a result.